Ja, guten Tag zusammen. Ich äh, freue mich, heute meine Masterarbeit vorstellen zu können mit dem Thema Blätterteigsiegel, Schadensphänomen und Restaurierung. Zahlreiche Siegel, vor allem aus dem 12. bis 15. Jahrhundert, zeigen ein auffälliges Schadensbild. Das Bienenwachs, aus dem sie hergestellt sind, spaltet sich parallel zur Oberfläche in feine, blättrige Schichten, weshalb man solche Siegel auch als Blätterteigsiegel bezeichnet. Es gibt Siegel, die nur eine leicht blättrige Struktur aufweisen, aber auch solche, die aus winzigen Schichten zusammengesetzt scheinen und bei geringster mechanischer Belastung zerbrechen. Bei den Untersuchungen wurde deutlich, dass es nicht ein einzelner schädigender Faktor ist, der das Phänomen verursacht, sondern vielmehr ein komplexes Zusammenspiel unterschiedlicher Einflüsse. Es handelt sich hierbei um die natürliche Alterung von Wachs und nicht, wie bisher vermutet, um einen Zusatz, der das Blättern verursacht. Bei der Alterung von Wachs gehen verschiedene Bestandteile verloren, vor allem solche niedermolekularen Bestandteile, die als Weichmacher im Wachs dienen. Sie sind wanderfähig, können an die Oberfläche gelangen und dort sublimieren. Ursache dafür ist unter anderem die komplexe Zusammensetzung von Bienenwachs mit amorphen und kristallinen Bereichen. Während der Alterung bilden sich vermehrt kristalline Strukturen, das Ölbindevermögen des Wachses sinkt und flüssige bzw. mobile Anteile, also die Weichmacher, wandern vermehrt aus. Wie rasch der Zerfall abläuft, ist von verschiedenen Faktoren abhängig. Schon die Aufbereitung des Wachses ist entscheidend. Häufig umgeschmolzenes oder stark erhitztes Bienenwachs weist demnach eine andere Struktur auf als frisches Bienenwachs aus dem Bienenstock. Das Wachs und vor allem Bienenwachs dieser Alterung unterliegt, ist aus der Farbe- und Lackindustrie bekannt. Die Mürbeerscheinung des gealterten Wachses entsteht jedoch nicht nur durch das Auswandern bestimmter Wachskomponenten bzw. den chemischen Veränderungen. Bei der Betrachtung von frischem Bienenwachs unter dem Rasterelektronenmikroskop konnte eine unregelmäßige, aufrechte Struktur der einzelnen feinen Wachsplättchen festgestellt werden, dies hier als Schema verdeutlicht. Bei der Alterung vernetzen sich solche Systeme und die ungeordnet erscheinenden Plättchen legen sich flach übereinander und werden glatter. Die plättrige Struktur von gealtertem Bienenwachs ist demnach das Ergebnis aus seiner chemischen Veränderung und der physikalischen Umordnung der Wachsstruktur. Hier ist auch der Grund zu finden, warum gefärbte Wachssiegel der gleichen Zeit wesentlich stabiler sind, auch wenn diese ebenfalls eine größere Härte und Sprödigkeit aufweisen. Ein pigmentiertes System ist immer stabiler als ein unpigmentiertes, da die Masse enger gepackt ist. Im speziellen Fall des Wachses verhindern die Pigmente außerdem, dass die Wachsplättchen sich wie bei dem ungefärbten Bienenwachs übereinanderlegen können und ordnen. Die folgenden Festigungsmittel wurden ausgewählt, da sie in Alkohol oder Wasser löslich sind und somit ungefährlich für das Wachs, das es zu restaurieren galt. Alle Mittel zeichnen sich dadurch aus, dass sie bei relativ hohen Konzentrationen sehr niedrig viskos sind und daher ein gutes Eindringen ermöglichen sollten. Ich kann leider nicht näher auf die Testreihen eingehen, jedoch schnitt bei allen Testreihen Aquasol am besten ab. Die einfachste Form, ein Festigungsmittel zu applizieren, ist das Aufstreichen mit dem Pinsel auf die Oberfläche, gegebenenfalls mehrfach oder vorgenetzt. Bisher konnten aufgestrichene Festigungsmittel jedoch nicht weit genug in das filigrane Gefüge eines Blätterteigsiegels eindringen. Daher wurde eine neue Methode unter Anlegen eines Unterdrucks recht erfolgreich erprobt. Vor der Restaurierung wurden die Presse der Urkunden und Siegel mit Zyklododekan geschützt. Das Siegel wurde dann in eine Schale mit zehnprozentiger Aquasöllösung gelegt, die sich im Unterdruckbehälter befand und der Druck von ca. minus 0,5 bis minus 0,6 bar eingestellt. Der Vorgang wurde pro Siegel fünfmal wiederholt, 
obwohl eigentlich schon nach der ersten Anwendung eine deutliche Festigung zu spüren war. Durch das Füllen der Lufträume entsteht eine Farbvertiefung. Die eingebrachte Menge Aquasol, wie Sie hier auf dem Foto sehen, wurde durch Wiegen der Urkunden vorher und nachher ermittelt und war durchaus erstaunlich hoch. Nach der Festigung zeigte sich auf der Oberfläche der Siegel ein leichter Glanz. Mit einem feuchten Wattestäbchen konnte dieser problemlos entfernt werden, denn Aquasol ist neben Alkohol auch wasserlöslich. Außerdem konnte die Oberfläche gereinigt werden, was vor der Festigung wegen der Fragilität der Siegel erst gar nicht möglich war. Die gefestigten und gereinigten Siegel wurden im letzten Schritt noch mit neuem, gefärbtem Wachs an den Rändern stabilisiert. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. The second uh, short presentation will be held by Paola Fagnola. She uh, is master's candidate at the Scuola di Alta Formazione e Studio in Rome. Please. Thank you for the opportunity and good afternoon. This presentation is a small part of my master thesis, which will be presented in April 2016 and is developed with the help of Silvia Soju, my thesis advisor, and Kathy Abbott as co-advisor. Tomorrow's Pass first started as an exhibition thanks to the efforts of Kathy Abbott, Jen Lindsay, and Tracy Rowledge inspired by an article written by Shunevrar in 1999, in which she showed some example of binders who, instead of remaking bindings in a traditional style, intelligently mixed design book binding and conservation ethos in their works. They gathered together a small group of selected binders from all over Europe and created an exhibition first hosted at the London Antiquarian Book Fair in 2003. The name comes from a statement of the British master bookbinder Edgar Mansfield. Surely it is better to create tomorrow's past than to repeat today's, which summarizes the idea of the group of using a modern sensibility in response to the individual needs of the book. Each member is a professional binder with an interest in and experience of conservation and handling ancient books and various binding structures. From a spontaneous aggregation, it slowly grew with the need to give it a structure, writing down a manifesto and the ethos that inspired the binders. Each binding is developed, first of all, in response to needs of the physical text block, which means that the books are rebound only when it's absolutely needed, respecting all the physical evidence, using new materials suitable for conservation to create new bindings that express a modern aesthetic that fits harmoniously with the ancient elements. The search for simplicity and the use of lateral thinking allow the binders to make really sound conservation bindings whilst expressing a sensitive aesthetic. All the superstructures are avoided and everything is kept as simple and honest as possible. Here are a few examples of the bindings made following tomorrow's past philosophy. As with many conservation treatments, the simplest look is one that requires the most work and effort. In this book, the sewing was broken in many places, the cover was torn and peeling back, and the spine and the whole book was filthy. I promise I will change this description. <laughs> Kathy Hebert chose to preserve the original cover, manning it with Japanese tissue and infilling the loss with handmade paper covered with gold leaf in a look reminiscent of Kintsuji, the Japanese technique for mending pottery with golden lacquer, highlighting the loss instead of hiding it. The new sewing supports were dyed to match the color of the ink. 
The result merges with the original elements, emphasizing the ancient beauty instead of making it look worn out. Uribros was found with just one board and two thirds of the spine of a non coeval binding. While maintaining the original sewing, the binding structure was slightly modified into a modern simplified binding to allow a better opening with less stress on the book block. The colors of the rebinding are inspired by the physical evidence on the book, in this case the marbled edges. The previous binding is kept together with a book in a face box. This book from the National Central Library of Rome didn't have a binding, only a temporary sewing torn apart in many points. The book was re-sewn on a handmade paper cover following a long stitch pattern. The external cover clips and wraps around the inner cover. The result is a non-adhesive and completely reversible binding that uses very well-known materials widely used in conservation treatments the aesthetic taking inspiration from the physical evidence of the book as an object. For example, in this case it was the color of the edges, giving the book a shape that fits harmoniously with the ancient elements, but with a glimpse of a modern aesthetic that overtly reflects the time of the conservation treatment, which will become part of the history of the book, its tomorrow's past. Thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Elsbieta Gorska Wiklo. She is from the University of Glasgow Argive Services. Please. Good afternoon. Sorry, it will be not Scottish accent. <laughs> My presentation, Ethical Challenges in Conservation, Industrial Heritage Archival Materials, rather than focusing on the materials used in the process of conservation, it will instead focus on the issues associated with ethical challenges in conservation treatment and the importance of ethics in the decision a conservator makes when choosing a suitable treatment as well as how this information can be shared. Industrial heritage archival materials can be defined as the remains of the industrial culture, which are of historical, technological, social, architectural or scientific value. Archival materials are information objects that serve as evidence of the past events. Within industrial heritage context, these remains are, for example, plants, drawings, architectural drawings and shipbuilding plants. Our University Glasgow Archive is a central place of deposit for the records of the University. Our halls are particularly strong in relation to industrial concern in the west of Scotland, such as shipbuilding. This year marks of the 105th anniversary of the American Civil War, an anniversary which for us in the preservation unit highlights significant connection between our collection and this event. One of archives activities within anniversary event was William Simon Ship Plants Preservation Project, long title. Beginning in the 2014, William Simon Plants Project was planned with the help of archivists, conservator, and student volunteer. From the beginning, 
The project raised questions about the information quality, accessibility in the future for academic, students, archivists, and researchers. Many of the questions how we will make sure that conservation decisions are based on enough information about the plant collection, who will provide that research on investigation, when and how. Should the preservation of plant collection focus on maintaining the original materials? Our project also raised questions about plant's technical language. Drawings is the communication language that uses graphics to represent an object, idea, design. The use of drawings as means of communication can be traced back science to ancient Egypt. It's an old saying, a single picture saves a thousand words. Our project compromised various stages. First, plans were unpacked and all packing discarded. When plan details were recorded, the main conservation problem was related to approach to these archival materials. As the industrial heritage collection, ship plants were working documents and the meaning of the plants with so-called reduced elements, and so due to their past storage and handling, many of them have large tears, major losses, and reinforcement with pressure sensitive and paper tape. The concept of minimum intervention began to become the central focus in conservation treatment. However, it was decided that some small area could be retouched in order to recreate finished square. During all conservation projects, it is, and our also, it was important to gain the view of the public, but it was also important to recognize the degree to which they view can be considered as being sufficiently informed. This stage of the project was to enhance the global reach and reputation of Simon plants, given their age and the fact that many of them were beautifully drawn, there was plenty of scope to promote this collection. In one successful instance of this, we used some of the plan images to compile a Flickr set and other social media, such as Twitter and blogs. During the project, I find myself in a conservator roles that also include co-coordinating and synthesizing the view of other specialists who form an integrated ethical framework to underpin the conservation project. I hope my short presentation serves as a starting point for reflection on archival conservation, conservator roles, and conservator ethic in the modern archive conservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. In your program, um, you can see the next presentation would be from Gayan Ali Elia Zian, but that uh, presentation is, has been cancelled. So now we go to the presentation of Constantina Constantini Du. She works in the Natural History Museum in London. Hello. Philippa and I were going to talk about the decision making with regards to the Birds of America by John James Audubon. Understanding why an activity is performed comes very close to understanding the activity itself. This uh, slide refers to Barbara Applebaum's characterization of an object, which underlines that us, conservators, should be aware of the different layers of meaning that an object may have. The Audubon plates make this quite evident, and these images show the storage of birds of America in the Natural History Museum and at the Windsor Castle. 
Now, the, there were common problems of the volumes in both institutions. There were tears and broken joints caused by the oversewing, the tight back spines, but also of the sheer size of the paper, which is double elephant folio. What is not so common are the values. So why preserving objects? Well, we preserve them because we love them, but also because they, are, they have values. So we need to establish the range of possible values which they have for different groups and the influences on significance. Objects are in dynamic relation with the groups, and as groups we can also mean institutions. The Natural History Museum is not just any museum, it's also a research center. It receives about 5 million visitors a year, but it's also a house to some 80 million specimens. It exhibits and uses objects to convey specific information, and its collections are with scientific reference. Within such a museum, there is a library, a library collection that has been built to meet the needs of curators, researchers, and visitors since 1881. It holds one of the world's finest collection of natural history literature, artwork, photographs, and manuscripts. The birds of America were acquired because of them being an early example of colored aquatins and depicting bird specimens in their actual size, or very close to it. The library accepts thousands of visitors per year, and perhaps this explains why the, the volumes were disbound in, um, in the 70s and they were rebound, and then they were again in need of conservation by 2010. The only thing that we know about them is that they were acquired in 1885. However, this is a different story at Windsor Castle. In contrast, the Royal Library copy of the Birds of America has a very different story. The publication was issued on subscription and King George IV was an original subscriber. There's documentary proof of this from the published subscriber list and records of payments within his accounts. It is therefore one of the few sets remaining in the hands of the original owners. Here you see the four volumes before conservation. They each had the binder's mark bound by Jay McKenzie. He was John McKenzie, who appears in the 1841 census, living in Westminster in London. We know that his workshop was in Golden Square near Regent Street, and there are several of his bindings in the Royal Library. He advertised as bookbinder to the king. At that time, both in-house and external binders were used by the royal household. Windsor Castle is um, a place where almost one and a half visitors come a year, and the books have always lived in the Royal Library within Windsor Castle. But it is also a place of home and work to hundreds of people, including the Queen, and what I like to call my office. The Library is a historically significant collection within an iconic set of interconnecting rooms. As well as being open to researchers and continuing to collect, it's also used for state and other official functions and plays an important role within the monarchy and government. Given the known history of the Royal Library volumes and the context of their owners and use, it was clear that the books should be kept as such, conserved and rebound into as close as possible facsimile bindings. However, significant intervention was necessary in order to make them structurally sound. Alteration of the construction to enable flat opening that would not be damaging to the plates required the addition of guards that could be folded into sections for flexible sewing, as shown in the picture of the model at the top. The current royal bindery has operated within Windsor Castle since the 18th century and is committed to the preservation of traditional hand skills alongside modern conservation techniques, and it was a matter of pride to be able to reproduce these bindings. On the left, you can see one of the old spines laid on top of the new. Here you see a volume on display in the castle during a lunch to which all the reigning sovereigns were invited to celebrate the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Our aim in this short talk has been to show that these two radically different treatments of the same item with the same conservation issues are both equally valid, determined by an object's accrued layers of meaning beyond the pure physical. And we are looking forward to producing a full depth discussion of this in an article shortly. Thank you. Also, thank you, Mrs. Rader, for the second part of the lecture. <laughs> I 
Next speaker, Angeliki Stasinou from the General State Archives of Greece, Athens. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, I'm so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon. So. Thank you. Although various types of binding structures have been extensively described, the simple yet stable binding structures of archive bindings have been ignored by researchers in the past. Even in the cases where an archive binding is recorded in a catalogue, the description is usually focused on the context of the gathered documents, paying no attention to the binding structure and its condition. According to the language of binding thesaurus compiled by Legatus, archival binding is an alternative label to stationary bindings, defined as the bindings found, found on books made to be written in, such as ledgers, account books, etc. A variety of structures were used for these books, but they were all intended to serve the same purpose, record or account keeping. Oops. Different types of archival bindings dating from the 17th to 19th centuries are kept in the collection of the General State Archives of Greece. The first type recorded can be represented by the stationary bindings from the island of Mykonos that have plain binding structures with limb leather covers and sewing on leather supports through which the text block is attached to the cover without any endbands. These notary bindings have sometimes one or two leather ties in the forage. In the same collection, a small notebook, unique for the characteristic forage flap and stamp tulip decoration, reflects an Islamic influence. Archive bindings were usually carefully kept because they served to the owner for record or account keeping. Many of these bindings represent mechanical wearing, caused usually by extensive use, which sometimes resulted in the deformation of the shape of the, sub of the spine. This led to the use of leather tackets, not only to hold the cover to the text block, but also to reinforce the spine to resist to such distortions. Stationary bindings and account books with stiff boards were used for record keeping during the Greek Revolution. Quarter leather or cloth bindings with decorative papers on the boards usually served for this purpose. For lighter structures like small notebooks where the text block consists only of one gathering, simpler ways for the attachment of the text block to the limp paper cover are used. Another type of binding that could also be described as archival is a very interesting version of traditional quick archival binding used to assemble loose leaf documents found in the records of the ministries of the Ottonian period from 1832 till 1862, which were kept according to the Bavarian administration filling system. They have a limp paper cover made of a blue European wove heavyweight paper. The exposed sewing pattern is visible in the spine. In the front cover, there is a lithographic printed title and the repository number indication. A representative sample of these bindings is the file of the Acropolis of Athens, which contains 223 documents concerning the first efforts for the restoration and enhancement of the monument and the return of the release of the Temple of Athena Niki. The filling system for this archive is organized by subject in chronological order. An index of contents is placed in the beginning of the text block, followed by documents of various sizes and paper qualities which are sewn together. The particular characteristic of these bindings is that each document or gathering of documents is secured with an individual, sorry, 
uh, with an individual thread in such a way you can see some, there is an individual thread here and here, um, in such a way that if this thread is cut, only the adjacent documents will be released, relieve, leaving the rest of the sewing intact. The documents bound in this simple yet stable way have been protected by this kind of binding structure and are preserved in much better condition compared to the unbound documents of later periods. Different styles of archive binding should be preserved as they provide evidence of the original record keeping practices of private or public services of a certain era. The once common practice of dismantling the existing binding structure for certain purposes like rebinding or digitization vanished the only point of evidence of archive practices and should be avoided. Conservation treatments should be limited to minimal interventions in order to preserve the individual features of these bindings for the researchers of the history of bookbinding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last presentation will be from Isabella Zadiak. She works at the Faculty of Conservation and Restoration of works of art from the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Classification versus, versus preservation, technique, materials, and conservation problems of photo albums from Polish collections. Classification. The first and the oldest group consists of artificial photographic album, albums, album factis. These were single and unique copies. The second group is composed of photo albums of trifles, tags and scraps, or simply scraps books. They were created in single copies and were based on notebooks available on the market. Edited photo albums make up the numerous third group, which can be divided into the following subgroups, with photographs mixed and with reproductions, based on photomechanical processes, colotype, photolithography, woodbury type, and halftone. They emerged thanks to the negative-positive process. This group includes the earliest book illustrated with photographs, The Pencil of Nature by Talbot. The next fourth group are the photo albums in the form of tribute books, thanksgiving books and address congratulation books. This stemmed from the well-established custom of formal and symbolic acts of recognition and loyalty paid by the subjects of the monarch. The fifth group consists of family photo albums. We can distinguish classical and atypical and amateur photo albums. Olszyński albums belong to the journalist, photographer, photographer, collector, amateur painter and art patron Marcin Olszyński. They included photographs alongside watercolors, drawings and poems. Investigation in, is currently underway to identify the photographic materials and techniques with the aim of determining the state of preservation of the albums. To date, an FTIR analysis using non-destructive method uh, has been perform performed, as well as single pH test, XR F fiber content testing and other analysis are planned for the near future. The technique materials and conservation issues are mentioned on the slide. Edited photo albums. The official presentation of the first edited photo album in Warsaw took place in 1857. The demonstrated work was an exhibition catalog complied by Bayer. 
Another example for this group is a view of Japan by Beato. The album represents a period when Beato focused on, on charming images on oriental themes. Family photo albums are a group of objects that is homogeneous in terms of function. The album were sold empty. They owe their style mainly to their out layout of manuscripts and Asian prints, prints and were prepared in different style. The construction of the book block of the albums, however, has more in common with cases meant to carry small and precious objects than with a traditional book page. This is due to the fact that the almost three-dimensional form of the photographs, photographs with their thick cardboard made them resemble engraved gems and coins rather than illustration. The commercial character of family photo album manufacturing resulted in a decline in the quality of the materials. The issue was widely discussed back in 1872 by the British Journal of Photography. Quote, the attention of, <coughs> sorry, the attention of manufacturers and dealers is at the present time being called to the unsatisfactory state of the greater part of the photographic albums now in use. They are, with some rare exception, exception, made for sale, not for service. Summary. Investigating the originals is the basis for further conservation activity. The fundamental problem is the low pH of the paper base, which will require deacidification in spite of preventive measures taken. It is worth mention, mentioning that, is, that this treatment Treatment seems re re relatively easy to perform in case of family photo albums, out of which we can remove the photos from time of treatment of longer periods. This, is, this does not apply to unique scrapbooks, like Olszynski photo albums or edited photo albums, which are a different issue and pasted photography. Some albums and photographs have suffered microbiological infestation. There is currently a need for an analysis of, an, of the impact of some treatments on photographs, as well as an, an investigation of the possibility of des, des, desinfection treatments of photo albums of pasted photographs. A civic a significant part of photo albums, mainly family photo albums, are an objects of utility in households. That is why limiting the conservation treatment to preventive measures is not sufficient from the point of view of the private user. The, or, the owner always prefer, prefer full conservation with which guarantees return to the original form and function. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>